Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad to see all of you here this morning. We're going to begin this morning with the song Holy Spirit. Join us as we praise our God this morning. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord. Holy Spirit you are Yeah. 
morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Special welcome to those of you who are here in the building, uh, to those who are joining us online, and to those who are still on their way. Uh, we are glad uh, to have the opportunity to be together today. And normally I say I have just a couple of announcements, but I feel like I have a whole boatload of announcements today. So bear with me as we uh, walk through this. First off, after worship today, uh, we are hoping that uh, many of you will have the opportunity to stick around for half an hour. Uh, it will be the opportunity that we have to decorate the sanctuary for the Advent and Christmas seasons. I know it seems like it's hit us in a hurry, but next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. So after church, we're going to move some stuff around and set up the tree and put up some of the things. So if you can stick around for half an hour, that'd be fantastic. Um, in the bulletin, there's an announcement about the Texas mission trip. Uh, I hope that some of you are thinking about that and that you'll get uh, me with uh, your intentions as soon as possible. Uh, in the back of the room, that's a lit up Christmas tree. That is an angel tree. Uh, affording us the opportunity to offer uh, Christmas gifts to folks who are connected with the foster care program at Presley Ridge. Uh, so you can take, and, and I think there should be a sign-up sheet back there. Is that a clipboard right there, Glenn? So uh, sign up uh, if you take a tag. Also in the bulletin, there's uh, an announcement about a uh, special program that is being run by our friend Penny Zeisloff called Gifts of Hope. It's this bazaar that actually started as a result of some of her interactions here, uh, but now it takes place at the Mount Pleasant Church of God, uh, and it is a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, do your Christmas shopping in ways that bring blessing uh, to folks, especially folks in poverty around the world. If you are a person who thinks of yourself as, I buy poinsettias at Christmas time and have them as a part of the uh, sanctuary. There are forms on the round table in the back to uh, order a poinsettia uh, and uh, you can get those in memory or in honor of somebody. And there is, if you're a member or friend of the congregation, there's a, should be a 97 and three quarters percent chance that you got a letter and an email about supporting the work of the church financially in 2025. Uh, and about the financial situation in which we find ourselves. Uh, if for some reason you didn't get one of those letters, they're on the tables in the back. Uh, I encourage you to take one of those. Um, one of the things that is in that letter is a, a, a request or an invitation for you uh, to return to the congregation uh, a piece of paper that indicates your ability or your intentions to give in 2025. Uh, and we're hoping that we will dedicate those intentions next Sunday in worship. So you can mail that back. If you want, you can take one of those and fill it out today and throw it in the offering plate. Uh, bring it on Sunday. But it'd be great if we could dedicate those next Sunday. Uh, the only other announcement of which I'm aware is that Matt Adler is going to come forward and uh, extend an invitation to you all. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the Three Rivers Ringers Handbell Choir will be having some concerts uh, the first two weekends of December. I wanted to make sure that you all were invited. Uh, this is a very talented group, and uh, for those of you who have been there before, I think you know that they're pretty good. Um, so I have some postcards here if you want dates and concerts time. We've already had two out of seven performances complete. We have five remaining. The closest one is in Mount Lebanon, uh, the Friday eight days after Thanksgiving, not the Friday after Thanksgiving, but uh, I have some postcards here. Does anybody want them? <laughs> okay. Okay. That's it. Thank you. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. What does God command of us? To love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. God does not call us to ease or to comfort, but to presence and abundance and grace in our struggle. 
Let us worship the God who believes in us and trusts in us and abides with us. Let us worship the God who will ask much of us, but will be beside us every step of the way. to confession. Are you in love with God? Do you show it in your words, your thoughts, your actions? Are you in love with your neighbor? Do they know this by your presence, your grace, your friendship? Or are you so obsessed with yourself that you have no time, no room, no pity on others or for God? Let us confess the limits we place on our love so we might be filled with God's limitless mercy. Sorry, I haven't done this for a while. <laughs> a prayer of confession, including a time of silence. Oh, holy, oh, holy God, God, we come, come in confession, confession for our lack of love. love. We, we have, have neither, neither loved, loved ourselves, ourselves nor our neighbors. neighbors. We have, we have passed, passed by, by suffering and misfortune because of fear or busyness or preoccupation. We have held prejudices against people as deep as those against the Samaritans we read about in the Bible. And we continue. Heal our pains, amend our faults, and guide us in ways of danger and compassion. For we pray in the name of Jesus, our most beloved neighbor, who cared for us even to the cross. Amen. The Assurance of Pardon. Beloved, the power of the Holy Spirit is at work within us. Because of that power, God is able to accomplish far more than all we can ask or imagine. So hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Speed to the 
Let us pray. Eternal God, who grants us glimpses of eternity in the midst of time, teach us to love you with our whole being and to love our neighbors as ourselves. May your gospel bear fruit among us as we grow in your truth, enabled by your spirit. Luke 10, 25, 37. Then an expert on the law stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to get life forever? Jesus said, What is written in the law? What do you read there? The man answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. Also, love your neighbor as yourselves. Jesus said to him, Your answer is right. Do this and you will live. But the man, the man wanting to show the importance of his question said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, As a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, some robbers attacked him. They tore off his clothes, beat him, left him lying there, almost dead. It happened, it happened that a priest was going down that road. When he saw the man, he walked on the other side. Next, a Levite came there. And after he went over and looked at the man, he walked by on the other side of the road. Then a Samaritan traveling down the road came to, admit to where the hurt man was. When he saw the man, he felt very sorry for him. The Samaritan went to him, poured olive, oil on his, poured olive oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he cared for him. The next day, the Samaritan brought out two coins. He gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of this man. If you spend more money on him, I will pay you back when I come again. Then Jesus said, Which of these three men do you think was the neighbor? The man was, do you think was the neighbor to the man who was attacked by the robbers? The expert of the law said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, then go and do what he did. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to ask the children to come forward for a few minutes, please. There's just a couple of us today, huh? Good morning. You can scooch over this way because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be behind this wall because I have some things here today. And you know what these are. For people who can't see, you want to tell them what they are? What do you think? Apples and, and an orange. You heard the story that Julia just read. And maybe you were able to pay attention to it. Maybe it's hard to do when somebody's up front reading. I want to tell that story again, and I'm going to tell that story with apples and oranges. Okay? So, there was an apple that was walking down the road one day. And the apple was walking down the road, and all of a sudden, that apple got attacked. It was a blender and a paring knife. It was horrible. And that apple got so beat up, and it couldn't move. It couldn't walk down the road any further, and it just lay there. Not too long after that, another apple came walking down the road. And that apple saw this one and got a scared and thought was afraid of the blender and a paring knife. And so it ran away as soon as it could. Another apple came walking down the road, and it saw this one, and this one squeaked out in its little tiny apple voice, and it said, please help me, help me. And this apple said, I know there's a lot of bad apples out there, and, and th those apples get themselves into trouble, and if I help this one, I'm going to have to help all of them. And so this apple just kept on walking down the road. This apple did not know what was going to happen. And as it lay there, all of a sudden, an orange came by. Now, I don't know if you know this, but apples and oranges don't like each other very much. Like later this week, you might get apple pie. You will not get apple orange pie. You will not get apple orange juice. Apples and oranges, they don't care for each other very much. And so when this poor little apple saw the orange coming by, it didn't even say anything. But the orange came along and thought, that apple is in trouble. 
that apple looks like it's been beat up. And so the orange stopped and it helped the apple. And together, the apple and the orange went to find some help. In the story that Julia read and the story that Jesus told, he ended with a question, which one of these was a neighbor to the person in trouble? The orange. The orange was an, even though apples and oranges aren't supposed to like each other very much, they figured out a way to love and to be connected. In the story that Jesus told, he went on to say, that part of our job as people who follow him is to learn how to love like this one. To learn how to love not worried about what other people say or think or do. I hope we can think about that. I wonder if you can pray with me. Can we pray together? Dear Jesus, thank you for the love that you give to us, for helping us to be connected to one another. Help us to realize how really connected we are. We love you, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Thank you for being up front. I have some activity pages. Is there somebody in the back today? We don't. So you're going back to the grown-ups who brought you. So let me offer you these. And then, Eleanor, would you do me a favor, and would you take these back to the table that's right behind you? And then if you're somebody who wants an activity page for children who are with you, talk to my friend Eleanor. She will hook you up. Thank you, Eleanor. The second reading is the one that you never want to be assigned when you're the lay reader. I'll do it. It's from Nehemiah chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. Listen for the word of the Lord. The Jeshana gate was repaired by Joeda, son of Phaseah, and Meshulam, son of Besoeda. They laid its beams and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. And next to them, repairs were made by men from Gibeon and Mizpah. Melatia of Gibeon and Jadon of Maranoth, places under the authority of the governor of Trans-Euphrates. Uziel, son of Harhaiah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Rephaniah, son of Hur, ruler of half a district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Jediah, son of Harumuf, made repairs opposite his house, and Hatush, son of Hashbaniah, made repairs next to him. Malkijah, son of Haram, and Hashub, son of Halohesh, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Does anybody, and I'll take hands on this, does anybody play those word games offered by the New York Times, Wordle, uh, Strands, Connections? Have you played Connections? I like Connections. Connections, they give you a, a series of 16 words, and then you have to group them. You have to connect these words. If you haven't tried it, you should try it. This morning, I want to throw out a few activities. This is Dave Carver version of Connections. Ask you to consider what these activities have in common. Playing frisbee, water skiing, open heart surgery, winning an argument, playing Marco Polo, giving a hug, getting stuck in traffic. There's at least one thing that connects all of these activities. One thing that is true of each of these. You think of what it is? You cannot do them alone. I, I don't have directional hearing anymore, but somebody nailed it. You cannot do it alone. None of these things are possible if you're by yourself. Now look, there, there are all kinds of things 
that you can and probably should do when you're by yourself, playing solitaire, practicing the accordion, <laughs> writing poetry, binge watching bad television. All of these are fine ways to be by yourself for a few hours. But if you are going to go water skiing or play Marco Polo, you simply need companionship. Here's something else that you cannot do alone. Be a neighbor. Better yet, love a neighbor. The word itself, neighbor, implies relationship, doesn't it? And neighboring, as Julia has already brought up, is the topic of today's gospel reading. Jesus has sent his followers, about six dozen poor, uneducated, untrained, mostly young people, out into the world around them, and he has charged them with being an agent of blessing in the world. He has commanded them to tend to the sick, to share in the common life, to offer peace to those that are around them. And after a while, they come back, and these kids are amazed. They have seen the power of the good, the power of the holy, to triumph over evil. And Jesus, he is so happy with, he is so proud of these kids that he fusses over them and he blesses them and, and he lifts those up even though the world might regard them, his followers, as being insignificant. And then this reunion is interrupted by a lawyer, a, a lawyer, a person who is really categorically the opposite of Jesus' followers. He's wealthy. He is well-educated. He is well-connected. He is well-respected. And it appears as though there's a case to be made for the fact that this lawyer is a little bit uncomfortable with all the attention that Jesus is giving to these folks who are on the margins. And so the lawyer says, what do I have to do to get eternal life? And Jesus shrugs, and he looks at the man, and he says, you tell me. You've got the training. What have you been taught? And this guy's been preparing for this his whole life. And he lays out a beautifully worded, theologically nuanced statement of the truth. We are called to love God with everything that is in us and to love our neighbor as ourselves. I mean, that's great, isn't it? And Jesus looks at him and says, bingo! A loose translation of the Aramaic. You have got it right. Case closed. But the lawyer wants to do a little bit more wordsmithing. And so he asks a follow-up. But who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? What, what's behind that question? Or, or maybe better, what's the question that the man is really asking? Who is my neighbor? It seems to me that the lawyer is looking for loopholes here. That he wants a moral or perhaps even a theological justification to ignore or mistreat or even harm someone else. Okay, okay, I get it. I'm to love my neighbor. But, but, but who does that include exactly? To whom do I owe the obligation of love? Who do I have to love? And, and then therefore... Who am I free to treat unlovingly? Now, maybe, maybe you haven't been asked that question before. Maybe nobody's looked at you and said, who's my neighbor? But have you heard any of these? <clears throat> Are they in the country legally? Him? Is he still using or did he get clean? Isn't she queer? There, there are all kinds of ways of looking for justification for some way that we want to marginalize or exclude others from some portion of blessing that we have received. And Jesus is apparently not interested in providing excuses for the mistreatment of anybody. And so he refuses to answer the question directly and he offers one of those darn parables. 
And instead of answering the question about who is or who is not a neighbor, and therefore who is and who is not worthy of being treated with love, decency, and respect, Jesus tells a story. And in so doing, Jesus invites the man to see himself as being in relationship with everyone, even those whom he might have been taught to disregard or even to despise. And, and the story he tells, it's a story that you know, right? I mean, you've heard of the Good Samaritan before. I'm not going to walk through it verse by verse, but I want to lift two aspects of the story for our consideration this morning. If you've been here recently, you know that for the past six weeks, we have been looking at how the people of God can use a variety of practices to cultivate faithfulness that expresses itself in gratitude towards God and in generosity towards the world that's around us. And so we have considered how engaging in prayer, Bible reading, worship, bearing witness, financial giving can shape us to reflect God's love into the world that's around us. And now today we join the rest of the church around the world in observing uh, what we call Christ the King Sunday. It is the end of our liturgical year. And on Christ the King Sunday, the church points to the ways that Jesus is in and over all of creation. It is to Christ alone that we owe our reverence and our devotion. And, and this morning we will consider one additional practice of faith, and that is of participating in the mission of Jesus in the world. How are we giving of ourselves in service and humility to the people that God loves as a concrete expression of our willingness to be marked as Christ's followers? So with that in mind, I want to take a look at verse 14 of Luke 10. This after this poor man laying by the side of the road had been disregarded for whatever reasons by the priest and the Levite, we read that this man from Samaria was so moved by the plight of the wounded traveler that he picked him up and he cared for him with tenderness and mercy. And Jesus doesn't give us this information, but it might be interesting to look into the character of this Samaritan a little more deeply. Where was he heading? Why was he on a road? I mean, it, it could be that this Samaritan, like the wounded man, was heading to Jerusalem, uh, from, uh, to Jericho from Jerusalem, or maybe he was going the other direction. We don't know. He was just, he was a traveler. That's, that's what we know. Another question. Where did the Samaritan get the oil and the wine and the bandages that he used? Do you, do you suppose that he had brought along this giant first aid kit just in case he happened along upon a mugging victim? Is there any basis for assuming that he had left home with all kinds of extra supplies? I, I don't think there's a reason to assume that. He had to decide right then, right there, about the possibility of using his own resources on behalf of another. Here's an example of a time I saw that in my own life. I had been traveling for some time in Africa, and uh, I was presented, very spur of the moment, with a need that uh, could have meant the salvation of an entire family. And it was clearly, at that moment, within my power to offer that. I was a long way from home. There were no ATMs in the village. I had a couple hundred bucks in cash, which if I gave to that family, could affect this change, but also meant that they would not be available for my use in the weeks to come. So as I struggled with what to do and how to respond to this, I took the opportunity to do something that I would encourage you to do just about any time. I excused myself. I pretended to go to the toilet. I'm not encouraging you to do that. Um, but I called my wife. You should always call my wife if you need good advice as she so often does, Sharon encouraged me to be my best self. So I handed over the money, trusting that the God who had presented me with this opportunity to help was a God who would bail me out of hot water in which I may or may not find myself in the weeks between when I was there and when I would get home. And I know uh, 
most of us in the room, we're Presbyterians and we're Americans and we like to plan and we like to be in control and we like to anticipate and we like to be moderate. And don't get me wrong, I encourage planned generosity. But we've got to realize whether we plan for it or we offer it up on the spot, true giving is offering our resources for, that are from the heart. It's not simply just tossing in something extra that we're not going to miss. We are called to be more in love with Jesus, to be more in love with our neighbor than we are with our own ideas about how things ought to be. And that leads to the second observation. After the fellow from Samaria played the role of first responder to this injured man and got him to safety, what did he do? Well, according to verse 35, the next day the Samaritan brought out two coins, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of this man. If you spend more money on him, I'll pay you back to you when I come again. A significant part of the way that this Samaritan was a neighbor to the wounded man is that he invited the larger community to be a part of the healing process. He leaned on the innkeeper to offer a level of compassion and care and inclusion to the one who had been victimized. To, to go back to my story about Africa, here's what happened next. After I had been home for about six months, I contacted a leader in the church in that country and I asked him to check in on my friend back in the bush. And I wired a little bit of money and I said, would you please deliver this? But since then, my friend in the bush and their family have received a great deal of love and care from the larger community, not because I'm always wiring money over, but because their community has become aware of the need and of the possibility that they can help this one who is in their midst. My mentor and friend Stan Ott calls this the, the with me principle. Stan points out that rarely, if ever, was Jesus active in ministry by himself. Whenever he got the chance, he was always taking somebody with him, Peter, James, and John. And it wasn't just Jesus. The folks who followed Jesus did the same. Paul, he was always with somebody like Timothy or Titus or Epaphroditus. Aquila and Priscilla were with Apollos and so on. And that's the principle laid out in that reading from the book of Nehemiah that I tried to give to you a few minutes ago. Now look, if you know it at all, the story of Nehemiah is amazing and, and wonderful. You can look through that book and you can see how God called Nehemiah to leave his place in the palace, to leave his comfort zone, and to go out and to establish Jerusalem as, as a safe and secure place for God's people to live, to worship, to dwell together. That's the whole story of Nehemiah. But Nehemiah chapter 3, the whole chapter, I did not give you the whole chapter, but the whole chapter of Nehemiah 3 is a list of names that you are glad you don't have to pronounce. Why did they bother to include that in the Bible? I'm convinced that it's because we all, we, we need to indicate and to, and to celebrate that the mission of God is for all of God's people. Those names in Nehemiah 3, those people in Nehemiah 3, they matter. The story of Nehemiah would not be the whole story if those people had not been able to offer their gifts. But today, as I mentioned, it's the last Sunday in the church year. Next week, we start all over again with the first Sunday of Advent. And I'm here to tell you, if you hadn't thought about that far ahead, that the year to come is going to be filled with adventure and challenge and risk and loss. You will not get through it alone. And you'd be foolish to try to pretend otherwise. So come with me. Let's go there together. And, and bring somebody with you. Have conversations 
with the children in your life about how and why you give to support the Lord's work in this place. Bring a, a friend to the next food distribution, maybe because they need food themselves, maybe because they need to help give out food, or maybe both of those things. Sit next to somebody new and worship. Come to Texas in February with the adult mission team. The author of the letter to the Hebrews puts it this way. Let us think about each other and help each other to show love than to do good deeds. We are in this together, beloved. Thanks be to God, we are in this together. Let's not forget that. Amen.
we now have the opportunity to uh, come together as God's people and to share our joys and our concerns, the things that uh, we have been praying about. Um, I will point out that our prayer families for the week are Helen Brownstein uh, and also Evan Walker. Uh, extend uh, our sympathy to the Arlette family. Um, Eleanor and Wayne's son Eric passed away. Invite you to continue in prayer for Michael, Michelle Kish's brother Joe McGinley. Joe's home from the hospital uh, and is doing better, but he is still in need of some care. Uh, and then um, some of you may have seen on social media or in the news uh, that uh, prominent American pastor Tony Campolo passed away this week. And Tony Campolo was a friend of mine and had been a friend to this congregation. He preached here on Easter Sunday in 2014. Uh, and uh, we give thanks for his life. Are there other things that you would share today? I see Ethan and then share. For those who might have caught it, yesterday morning, the Montour episode of KD Quiz aired, in which we won 425 to 305. So, it was good. Oh yeah, and Peter's here, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's Peter's here, back from college. Sherry? Our friend Dawn has had another surgery, so prayers for healing and strength as he recovers. He's just had a series of uh, surgeries and health issues. Okay. I have two. Um, one is for my Aunt Sue. Um, her father passed away, Jack Ibes, mm -hmm. uh, 92 years old on Monday. And um, for my friend Rachel Bauer, um, her uncle was the um, battalion chief who passed away this mm. week. So um, he had a heart attack, I think, at the scene of that fire. So just prayers for her family. Okay, thank you. Online, the High Slips uh, prayer, offer a prayer of gratitude. Jim was driving home one night, and it was dark and rainy, and a deer jumped right in front of their car. Their car got totaled, but Jim is okay and safe. Uh, prayers for the Marks family, a uh, former co-worker of mine, Richard Marks, I learned on Thursday, has um, moved into palliative care uh, after emphysema and lung cancer, and I guess it, it's been very difficult. So just prayers for the Marks family. So, Andy, we have to update the bulletin because I think it lists her wrong age in there. But uh, how beautiful it has been to pray for this young woman who has struggled with heart and cancer problems. And now that she's reached her 12th birthday. That's a beautiful thing. Um, just prayers for families as we enter into the holiday season and for difficulties it may pose after the election and political atmosphere. Just prayers for Vivian. She has an audition tomorrow with like a regional high school choir. I'm okay. pretty nervous about it, so just <laughs> pray for her. Wonderful. I just wanted to, um, when we, the transition of holidays from Halloween to Christmas, and it's very rare that society like it doesn't it doesn't acknowledge Thanksgiving like mm -hmm. it used to, or it, I don't know how it's ever been. But right now, I'm seeing like Christmas decorations right after Halloween, and um, that angers me. But um, that's a prayer concern in a way, <laughs> in itself. But um, setting that aside, I just want to give thanks for everything that we take for granted. Um, I hope society feels the same way, whether they showed it in their yards or not. Um, it's very easy to overlook the things that we take for granted. Just getting here safely without hitting a deer, um, without having a heart attack, 
the simple things that you need to give thanks for. The importance of gratitude. Yes, thank you. It bothers me too. <laughs> I might have been a little judgy when I asked my wife if her, if her favorite station had started playing Christmas music yet. <laughs> Declan, do you have something, buddy? Um, the prayers that we can have as safe travels before Thanksgiving. Okay, yes. Not seeing any others, friends, I'll invite you to join me in uh, prayer together. Holy God, it is probably true that for many of us, our prayers look a lot more like shopping lists than they do like thank you notes. Help us to begin our prayer with an awareness of who you are, of how you have been at work in the world, and of how you have put us in spots where we have seen and experienced blessing. Help us to begin our day with expressions of gratitude and thanksgiving. And as we've said, we ask that you would protect us from sort of segmenting that into some particular day or uh, some slice, but that, that, that we might be those who are uh, characterized by gratitude and thankfulness. And that we might come before you with requests using those hearts, those minds, those lips that have been shaped by gratitude. Some of the blessings that we have received, Lord, they have worn us out. Some of the family that you have given to us have stepped on our last nerve. Some of the opportunities for service uh, or for generosity have graded on us. They are opportunities that we have received and, and seen in you, from you. Give to us, Lord, then wisdom and patience as we seek to determine how best to respond to these opportunities that are in front of us. We lift to you those concerns that we have named out loud. We pray for our friends who are in grief, for those who are facing difficult medical diagnosis, for those who are unsure. We pray for those whom we do not know, but who stand in harm's way, who fear food insecurity, who've had their lights or their water cut off this week. And we ask that you would help us to be wise and generous as we seek to respond. We pray for those who are trapped in some space of, of self-hatred uh, or some place of discomfort uh, and, and who have medicated themselves and have thereby entered into addictive patterns. We pray for your intervention. We lift up to you, Lord, those who are striving in the world to be those points of light. And we ask that you would give us the grace to encourage them and to become that when we are able. We pray for, your, for our family around the world who stands in, in, in fear of bombing, at risk of genocide, on the edge of oppression, in fear of marginalization. We pray that you would give to your church and to us, your people, the ability to move towards justice and hope and healing. On this Christ the King Sunday, we proclaim that you are the supreme power, that to you every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. 
And so we begin that by bringing our needs and our tongues today. We're thanking you for being here, for calling us into the world that you love. It is in the name of Jesus the Christ that we pray and for his sake and using the words that he himself has given us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Presenting our tithes and offerings. The invitation to the offering. The invitation to the offering. Stewardship is recognizing that the abundance surrounding us comes from God. We show our gratitude for being entrusted with these gifts by giving back to God a portion of these blessings. Stewardship is our lifelong process of growth in becoming faithful as we manage and enjoy God's blessings. God has blessed us, and in turn, it is our privilege to share those blessings freely. Stewardship is not about money, it's about faith. We see the way God works through our willingness to share and bringing hope and transforming lives. May our own lives be transformed as we see the power of God's healing and reconciling with love expressed in small everyday acts of generosity. Prayer of Dedication. Heavenly Father, may one example of the Samaritan guide me to do that which is pleasing in your sight. Open my eyes and all my senses to see and feel the humanity of everyone I met. Give me the strength to extend myself to the hurting of the world and see them as, and see them as you see me, children of God. Therefore, as my brothers and sisters, as my neighbors, amen.
Now, beloved, go out into the world in peace and have courage. Hold on to that which is good and return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the suffering. Love and serve the Lord, honoring all people wherever you are. Go out now with the love of God the Father, with the grace that flows through Jesus Christ, and in the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.